Earlier this week, a hacker, insider, or whistleblower was able to hack into the servers of the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia, exposing thousands of emails between proponents of the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis, as well as documents and data related to the CRU's highly secretive research. Earlier today, the Corbett Report had a chance to talk to retired climatologist Dr. Tim Ball about these leaked emails and their significance. Well, the significance is that um, it confirms uh, suspicions that I've had in my 30 years of working on a, in climate science, that I, I saw uh, the hijacking of climate science, particularly by uh, computer modelers, and then by a small group of people associated with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, but, of course, uh, the difficulty was that even though I sensed that there were these things going on, proving it is extremely difficult. But now, suddenly, with the exposure of these files, it's not only a smoking gun, it's a battery of machine guns that has, that has uh, been exposed. And uh, it, it really is deeply disturbing because what you've got here is confirmation of this small group of scientists who, by the way, Professor Wegman, who was asked to arbitrate in the debate about the hockey stick, um, he identified 42 people and said, look, uh, these people are all publishing together, and they're also uh, re peer-reviewing each other's literature. So there's a classic example of uh, the kind of thing that bothered me. About 20 years ago, uh, I started saying, well, why are they pushing the peer review issue such, so big? Why are they saying, well, you haven't published peer review and you haven't done, done this peer review? And now, of course, uh, we realize it's, it's because they had control of their own process. And um, that's clearly exposed in, in, these, um, in these emails. So for me, um, it is just confirmation of, of very deep uh, suspicions I've had. But on a, on a global scale, it's frightening because this group of people not only controlled the Hadley Center, which uh, controls the, um, the data, global data on temperature through the uh, Hadley uh, Climate Research Unit, um, so the, the global temperature record uh, is in their hands, but they also um, control the IPCC. And, um, and so um, they, they've manipulated that, and we, we read in the emails how that was done. And, uh, and of course, the IPCC has become the basis uh, in all governments for uh, the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Accord, and so on. That's exactly right. And of course, the, the ramifications of what we're talking about are, are huge. So uh, can you give us an indication of, of some of the, the specifics that you found disturbing about uh, there are many different issues that were touched on in these emails and documents, but some of them include um, active collusion to avoid uh, releasing information pertaining to freedom of information requests. Some of them pertain to uh, attempts to get James Sayers removed from the editorial board of the geophysical review letters. Uh, many other startling issues. Were there any that stuck out for you? Well, I, I think that the, those are some of them. But, uh, of course, one of the first things is the overall tone of, of the emails, uh, the nastiness, the viciousness, the, uh, the personal comments about people. Um, I mean, I, I knew John Daly, uh, who, who passed away a little while ago, and the comment about almost to the, to the, to the delight that he's gone. And um, those kinds of, of things are really deeply disturbing. But, but beyond that... Um, it's, it's the orchestration of, of the whole publishing uh, field. And um, there's a couple of things that interest me. For example, uh, the emails between um, Andrew Revkin of the New York Times and these people. So clearly he, was, uh, he got information from them but was also a conduit for them uh, to push their arguments. But, but it, it's also um, not only the attacks on individual scientists, but the attacks on editors of journals uh, attempting to control that whole journal process and um, uh, the emails that talk about um, making sure that they, they get uh, the right name. So, for example, if, if an, a journal requires, the editor requires five um, independent names uh, to act as possible review editors, they provide those names, and of course it's always from their own people. And uh, so those sorts of things absolutely stand out. 
and um, uh, the overall, it's it's the the orchestration. Uh, each one of the things in its in and of itself is is really objectionable, um, as I said. But putting it all together, where they're literally controlling. The, the, the climate science and anybody that dares to question to to, uh, to what they're saying, and so uh, those are the things that really bother me. And I, just to give you a quick comment on this, Professor Deming, um, here's an, here's a comment that he wrote back in um, in um, to his experience. He said, with the publication of my article in Science in 1995, I gained significant credibility in the community of scientists working on climate change. They thought I was one of them, someone who would pervert science in the service of social and political causes. So one of them let his guard down. A major person working in the area of climate change and global warming sent me an astonishing email that said, we must get rid of the medieval warm period. Now, when Deming came out with that at the time, there was quite a furor about it. But now, in the light of the, these exposures, we see that Deming was absolutely right in, in what he was claiming. And of course, the person that uh, sent him that email was Jonathan Overpeck. And Overpeck's emails are all over those files. And of course, what they're talking about is the problem they had, James, that they kept saying, oh, no, the 20th century and the latter part of it is the warmest ever. And, of course, skeptics like myself and Richard Lindzen and Patrick Michaels were saying, no, hang on a minute. It was warmer a thousand years ago when the Vikings were in Iceland and Greenland. And, um, and of course, that's why they decided that they'd have to get rid of the medieval warm period. And they achieved that with the hockey stick. In other words, that they completely rewrote the history. And um, you, you can see uh, how they've done this, not only with that particular record, um, but with, um, with the historic records as well, the actual temperature records. The uh, Hansen and the group uh, where they've been reducing uh, the older temperatures, making it colder than it was, and which then enhances the warming in the, in the, uh, the recent times. So the manipulation of records on this level is, is you have to think, it's, it's got to be criminal somewhere. There certainly are indications of activity that appear to be collusion to, to break laws and things like that. We'll have to see what the legal fallout from this is. But as you mentioned, the media fallout is, is particularly interesting, noting that people like Revkin were actually corresponding with these people and are now running cover for them in the New York Times. And, of course, The Guardian and other places that one would expect are, are running the usual types of stories about how this isn't a big deal and no one should be concerned about it. Um, of course, uh, the, the, the media sources that we would expect are running cover for, for these guys in this story. So uh, do you have any suggestions for people out there to go for uh, unbiased views about this? Uh, what, what are some good sources of information? Well, I think that the, the you know, climate audit, uh, McIntyre's site, because he's the one that uh, was pushing uh, Jones for the information freedom through the freedom of information. And by the way, of course, the, what's, what's disturbing about that is not only Jones and, the, and the, Hadley, the Climate Research Unit involvement, but also the involvement of the UK Met Office. I mean, there's, there's a thing on, on, uh, on McIntyre's site today saying that as recently as November the 12th, 